Last week, AMD invited about 150 tech media persons from around the world to the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, California to present to us additional information about the upcoming Ryzen 9000 series of CPUs codenamed Granite Ridge, as well as the new Strix Point Mobile SoC, both featuring the brand new Zen 5 microarchitecture. We have a smattering of new information about the desktop CPUs in particular, which I'm gonna be focusing on today. We have some performance numbers that AMD shared, but most importantly, right here at the top, we have an actual launch date. It is July 31st for the Ryzen 9000 series CPUs, as shown here. And we also have a somewhat looser launch date for the unfortunately named Ryzen AI 300 series of CPUs that will be in laptops and mobile devices. Those should actually launch a little bit earlier on July 28th, but since AMD works with third-party partners like Asus, MSI, and other laptop manufacturers, that date's a little bit more loose, but you should start to see those devices on store shelves on July 28th. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Thermaltake's EX Series fans, featuring magnetic force connectors that can daisy chain fans together to simplify installation and cable management. CT120 EX fans feature solid all-around performance and a touch of tasteful RGB lighting. The Swafan EX Series revolutionized case fans by adding swappable fan blades, and the Tough Fan EX Pro Series sports best-in-class high static pressure for use with radiators and an aggressive all-black design. And all of them feature larger magnetic force connectors for easy wiring. For more on the EX Series fans from Thermaltake, click the sponsor link in the video description. So let's start with the new info we have on the Granite Ridge CPUs, the Ryzen 9000 series of processors in terms of the CPU lineup and the basic specs that AMD shared at Computex. There's not too much more beyond that, but it does seem like that 9700X rumor that AMD might be increasing the TDP is not the case and that's sticking with 65 watts along with the 9600X. The tech day was composed of multiple presentations by various tech leaders at AMD. Let's start with Mark Papermaster's new information on the Zen 5 Micro Architecture, which is gonna be in the Granite Ridge CPUs as well as the new Strix Point SOCs. As I show you some of these charts from AMD, do note that they were provided by AMD. These haven't been independently verified yet, so you should wait for reviews to come out, but AMD is claiming a 16% average IPC or instructions per clock uplift versus Zen 4, and that's pretty significant. This chart is showing a range of games and productivity workloads. And do note that they're comparing a 9950X to a 7700X here, but since we're just looking at IPC and they're running them both at a fixed frequency of four gigahertz, it is a valid comparison. Oh, but you should also note that all these results are up to for all of the charts I'm showing you today. According to Mark Papermaster, the IPC uplift is derived from four areas of improvement in the microarchitecture, which I'm briefly gonna cover, starting with instruction fetch and decode advances where they were able to achieve less latency while also getting more accuracy and throughput. Zen 5 also has integer execution advances with wider dispatch and execute paths. We have improved load store queues thanks to increased data bandwidth, and we have better floating point and vector math units with AVX 512 support. Next, we're gonna quickly run through some AMD comparison benchmark charts Again, these are AMD provided numbers, so they should be viewed with skepticism. Note that all results are up to per the footnote. And since they already showed some of these charts for the 9950X at Computex, this time they were focusing on the other three CPUs in the stack, starting with the 9900X, the 12 core, which notably they compared to Intel's top end CPU, the 14900K, if you're ignoring the 14900KS. Again, I'm not gonna to focus too much on these numbers because they're provided by AMD, but we have a handful of productivity and content creation stuff, and we have some games that they tested as well. Moving over to the 9700X, which was compared to the 14700K, again, AMD says, it is faster at just about everything that we are willing to show you in these tests, including, wow, look at that handbrake improvement. So AMD appears to have a fair amount of confidence in their eight core 9700X. And then here's the six core 9600X, which AMD has compared to Intel's Core i5-14600K. And again, according to AMD, it is faster across the board. Comparisons to Intel are totally valid, but a lot of people have been wondering how the Ryzen 9000 series will stack up to AMD's X3D CPUs, and AMD did a comparison there, but not with the 7800X3D. They compared it to the 5800X3D, which you would expect the 9000 series to be faster than. And according to them, the 9700X, the single CCD eight core, is 12% faster on average compared to their couple generations old 5800X3D. And I did note that they're willing to test a much wider range of games here than what they showed us 
with the Intel processor comparison. But even with that, there's still a couple games where the 5800X 3D is a little bit faster. They did mention the 7800X 3D and said that the 9700X can be faster than it as well, situationally in certain games, depending on the settings and resolution. You probably saw I got some close-up shots of the 9950X that they had on display there, both with the heat spreader and without the heat spreader. It looks pretty much the same as the 7000 series CPUs in terms of the heat spreader itself, but AMD said that they actually did some improvements there too. The heat spreader redesign allowed them to improve thermal resistance by 15%, which led to a seven degrees Celsius temperature reduction at the same TDP. And according to the end notes, they got these results by comparing a 9950X to a 7950X, which both have the same 170 watt TDP. Who knows if the Zen 5 versus Zen 4 microarchitecture was having any impact there, but we did confirm that AMD wasn't calculating TDP differently in this case versus previous generations. They are using the same methodologies, and here you can see where apart from the top N16 core, they have reduced the TDP for all of the other chips while also improving performance. Rounding things out for the new info on the desktop side, we have a clearer view of AMD's 800 series chipset family. So these are gonna be new motherboards that are launching, although they are not launching at the same time as the new processors on July 31st. We're expecting these to launch a couple months after that. We don't have a clear date yet, but we'll have the X870E and X870 at the top end. Those are gonna have USB 4 by default, 40 gigabits per second, which is really nice. These will support two by eight setups for the graphics, which is nice if you wanna do dual GPUs, if you're doing a workstation setup. This is our first look at the lower end chipsets, the B850 and the new B840. B850 is gonna get Gen 5 for the NVMe slot, which is nice for high-speed SSDs. You'll still have Gen 4 for the graphics, and it'll be up to the motherboard manufacturer if they wanna do Gen 5 on the top PCIe slot for graphics as well. That will be the case with some motherboards. And here you're also gonna get USB 3.2, which is 20 gigabits per second. Finally, the AMD B840 series is only gonna have Gen 3 for PCI Express, so that is cut down pretty significantly in terms of connectivity. The USB 3.2, 10 gigabits per second, only memory overclocking, so, so at least they're allowing memory, but you won't be able to do CPU overclocking on B840 motherboards. You'll also have a little bit more limitation in terms of the GPU setups. Next, I'm gonna briefly cover what was actually the majority of the presentation material that we received there, because AMD, if you didn't notice, they're, they're doing AI now. They're doing AI everywhere, and a lot of these presentations had AI repeated ad nauseum, which some of us were a little bit interested in, but a lot of us were not. But here's a high level overview of the new Strix Point SoC that's gonna power the next generation of AMD laptops and mobile devices. It of course has Zen 5 CPU cores. It's gonna have up to 12 core configurations and they're including not just RDNA 3.5 integrated graphics, but also the XDNA 2 next generation NPU or AI acceleration unit. Now it should be noted that the NPU is only going to be included on these mobile chips. It will not be included in the desktop Ryzen 9000 series CPUs, although those do have AVX 512 and other things that can still do AI workloads. But if you feel some hesitance from tech media in general to delve too far into AI stuff, it's because there's still a lot of question marks in that area. AI benchmarking is still not standardized and AMD told us directly that they are expecting some better applications that can test the various capabilities of AI specific hardware like NPUs, but that software is still probably nine to 12 months out from being published and made available to reviewers. It's also worth noting that not all AI tasks stress the hardware in the same way. This chart is somewhat helpful once you figure it out. The left axis is model size, the bottom axis is frequency of infrared, so for something like an LLM or running stable diffusion or image generation, it's only gonna stress the hardware when the user inputs something, asks a question, or does a prompt to create an image. Versus something like real-time vision, real-time audio, things where they want AI to be looking at something and monitoring it in real time or over time in order to get some data or inference out of it. Those tasks are continuously running and they will require the AI software to run continuously and to have a load on the NP unit as well. So again, AMD shared a lot of information about their XDNA architecture and how it's designed and how it works. And they had a bunch of laptop demos showing various AI things that the laptops were doing. But the general vibe from the tech media that I talked about was that we were hoping for a little bit more focus on the hardware, on the CPU side, versus the AI stuff, because it's really hard to tell how much end users actually want this AI stuff right now versus how much it's just being pushed on us by manufacturers. And as I already mentioned, it's very difficult to benchmark right now 
and quantify like this AI hardware being better than this AI hardware. The other part of those Strixpoint SLCs you might be interested in is the iGPU, the RDNA 3.5 graphics that's integrated. And we did get a little bit more info on that, but as the name implies, RDNA 3.5 isn't the advancement to RDNA 4 that a lot of people were hoping for at this point. So basically we're getting a bunch of optimizations and since these are destined for use in mobile devices, a lot of those optimizations are about power savings. So AMD is claiming improved performance per watt and performance per bit. And when compared to the previous generation Hawk points, the graphics workloads show a 19 to 32% higher performance if set to a 15 watt limit. So was there anything else interesting at the tech day? Well, we had some breakout sessions that were smaller groups, and I'd say the most interesting one by far was the overclocking because there are some improvements to overclocking with the Ryzen 9000 series. Let's start by talking about memory. It says new AGESA supporting up to DDR5-8000. This doesn't seem to separate the 800 series motherboards from the previous gen 600 series motherboards. So I'm hoping that a lot of existing motherboards might be able to get this AGESA microcode update for higher speed DDR5 support. And there's a cool new feature in uh, Ryzen Master, memory overclocking on the fly. So rather than resetting or doing a bunch of stuff in the BIOS, you can actually just plug those values into Ryzen Master and it will update the settings without the need for a reboot. They demoed that for us and it seemed to work without problems. Also, for CPU overclocking, this is a BIOS feature by the way, they now have a Curve Shaper, which is an update to the previous Curve Optimizer, which allows the user to reshape the underlying voltage curves as set by Curve Optimizer via three different frequency temperature bands, which basically gives you 15 slots in the UEFI where you can input data depending on the settings you're going for. As of now, this feature is only accessible in the BIOS, but they did comparison of Cinebench R23 NT scores, it was about 42,000 at stock, bumped up to 43,898 with PBO Plus and Expo enabled, and increased about 900 points or so to 44,688 when they enabled the Curve Shaper. But that wasn't all for the overclocking demo, they had an LN2 setup as well. They were trying to hit the world record with Cinebench R23, which was 50,843 before this event. But with the liberal application of LN2 and some assistance from Steve, AMD's overclocker Bill Alverson was able to hit 55,000 plus. Pretty impressive boost over the current world record, and eventually the top score that we saw was 55,296. He did that at 6.5 gigahertz all-core frequency. He did try to push it to 6.6 after that, but ran into some stability problems. AMD also had a full demo area set up with a bunch of laptops and a few desktop systems as well. I browsed some of these. Notably, there was this Acer monitor that had eye tracking built into the panel at the top of it, which also used AI in some way to make 2D images 3D. And you actually didn't need glasses when you were standing in front of this monitor to get the 3D experience. And granted, you had to kind of be in the sweet spot right at the center of the monitor, but actually did work somewhat well. It was a little disorienting. And of course, my camera is probably not picking up that 3D image at all, but, but trust me, it was there. And we ran down the line to test some of the other AI demos, like taking a picture of yourself and then telling it to turn you into a robot and stuff like that, which is really what AI is, is designed for these days. Rounding things out for my recap though, apart from the major topics I already covered and getting some FaceTime with some tech friends who I hadn't seen in a while, or at least not since Computex for a lot of them. Were there any other tidbits of knowledge that dropped that you guys might be interested in? Yes. Fifth gen AMD Epic CPUs were teased with a single slide by Mark Papermaster showing their up to 192 core, 384 thread configuration using Zen 5 chiplets with 12 cores per chiplet and having features like an AI trusted IO feature and a combination of four nanometer and three nanometer technology. I am cautiously optimistic that we might eventually get some Threadripper variants of these, but we're expecting 5th gen AMD Epic to drop in the second half of 2024. They also showed us a roadmap, which is lacking a lot of information like dates along the timeline at the bottom, but it does say Zen 6 and Zen 6C are on the roadmap and they are on track. And they even mentioned Zen 7 by name a few times, although it wasn't included in any of these slide presentations. And lastly, I'm gonna end with this socket AM5 update. This is just comparing AM4 to AM5 and highlighting socket longevity, which is one of the things I've really appreciated that AMD has done since they kind of came back with the AM4 socket. Socket AM5 was originally promised to be supported through 2025 plus. They've now extended that to 2027 
Plus. So if you're investing in the platform, AMD is promising, at least for now, that you'll probably have at least a couple generations of new CPUs launching on that platform in the future. But that is gonna wrap it up for this recap of AMD's Tech Day. Again, the Ryzen 9000 CPUs should be launching or on store shelves July 31st, and we're probably gonna have some reviews coming out maybe around that time frame as well. So if you're not already subscribed, consider subscribing to my YouTube channel so you can be notified of those videos when they go live. Consider hitting the thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it. And if I have any relevant links, I'll put them down in the video description below, as well as a link to my store at paulsharbor.net where you can buy yourself some awesome merchandise to help support my channel. Thank you guys once again for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one.